good morning. Welcome to Orange City United Methodist. I guess it's actually a little bit late, so I was waiting for some more people to show up. So, But uh, we're glad y'all are here. Uh, those of you online, thank you for joining us. Will y'all stand and let's worship and uh, join me in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your great love and your, your awesome power and this beautiful morning. We just thank you for your presence here and just pray that you'll um, let us hear from you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. I don't know about you, but this one works for me. Your love awakens me. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Orange City United Methodist. And those of you who are watching online, we are so glad that you joined us today also. And for those of you that are here, there's a book at the end of the row. And if you would take that um, and um, sign in your name. Um, and if you're visiting us today, uh, welcome. So good to see everybody. 
Um, we have a newly designed weekly prayer card. These are located in the narthex. Please take one with you and pray with us. We will all be praying together during the service, and we will ask you to continue to pray throughout your week. So if you have the card with you, you can do that. Set those reminders. We will have one combined service worship service on Sunday, July 30th at 10 a.m. The worship committee is hosting coffee and donuts during the uh, during donuts following the service. So we'll get a, a good word from God and some coffee and donuts, which is a great thing, I think. Anyhow, last day for the O Orange City United Methodist Church Back to School Fun Drive will be July 31st. These donations can be placed in our offering on Sundays or bring your donation to the church office Monday through Friday during our office hours. Please make sure you designate and assign the donation back to school on your envelopes or on the memo of your checks. Um, okay, so we're doing that a little differently. It used to be we would bring in folders and paper and stuff like that. This time what we're doing is we're collecting money, and I guess they're going to uh, repurpose it for the school system. Uh, and we support Orange City United Methodist. And I'm sorry. We support Orange City Elementary School. <laughs> yeah. I, when I saw the uh, Your Love Awakens, I thought, oh, well, yeah, that'll help. <laughs> okay. Um, if you have prayer requests, just call them out. And if, if, uh, if you... Um, uh, we'll pray for them. Also, uh, um, we're going to pray together in just a minute. So right now, if you have a prayer request on your heart, just call it out, and we'll, we'll agree with you. Okay, your friend Jeff. Chet, okay, okay, Joyce, okay, any others? Okay, Father, we, we just come to you now, and we lift up these prayer requests. Father, we have things on our heart, we have things in our mind that we want to pray for, and we know that, that you know about things already. And you have awakened us. You've awakened our spirit within us, and we want to agree with your spirit in, in uh, praying for people and praying for situations around the world and in our community. We just ask that you have your way, and we, just, uh, we praise you that you care for us and that you hear our prayers. And your word says that we're two or three are gathered in your name. You're in the midst, so we know that you're in the midst of us right now. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you're leading us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And now let's pray Jesus' prayer, which is our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, and now Jill Woods is going to come and do the children's moment. So if you are a child or childlike, <laughs> um, come on up. Well, I was going to say, thank you for volunteering to stay. Hey, how's everybody this morning? Shall we have, should we get out, do you want to get the carpet pad? Okay. We've got a little experiment to do today, so. Okay. So, have you ever promised your mom or dad that you would do something? Like, do you ever promise to clean your room or pick up your toys? Say, I'll do that. Yeah, that's what you say, right? It's like a promise. Well, you know what? God has given us lots of promises, and he is always true. He will always do what he says he will do. Well, you know, we've been studying um, Noah 
and what happened with the ark and all the animals, and then all the water was flooding, but everybody was okay in the ark because Noah listened to God. And then now all the water is receding, and God is making a promise, and he said to Noah that he would never flood the earth. He would keep his promise. And you know what? He gave them a sign. He put a rainbow in the sky, and that was a sign of his promise. And now when I see a rainbow in the sky, I think, oh, God, you are good at keeping your promises to us. So, Ava, can you hold this microphone for a minute? And I'm, I'm going to do a little show and tell about a rainbow, okay? Can you hold this? So when all these colors, when that color off the Skittle is coming together, it's kind of making a rainbow, isn't it? There's lots of things that remind us of God's promises, but do you know what book we can look at to always find God's promises? The Bible? Right. God gives us lots of promises. So let's pray. God, help us to always look to the Bible, to look at your promises, and help us to keep our promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, to help you remember that. Well, there you go, Ava. There's your Skittles for the day. There you go, Joelle. Charlotte, okay? Thank you. Hey, that actually looks good. Thank you, Ava. It does look pretty cool, doesn't it? at the beginning. You didn't give it enough time. <laughs> right. You got your fan club back there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, y'all want to stand and uh, pass the peace and say good morning to your neighbor. Let's start heading back.
song is called How Great Is Your Love. You can always sing about that, right? From the dark I called your name Into darkness Your mercy came You called me out Lifted me
have the ushers to come forward. We believe here to reach, serve, and love like Jesus. And we know that Jesus' love transforms people's lives. And uh, that's what we are committed to. And we have four groups that meet here that transform people's lives. And they come here because they really can't go anywhere else. We offer them low Low rent is the best way I can say it, but we believe in transformed lives, and we help them so that they can have a space where they can help transform lives. Al-Anon, NA, we have our space here. So we, we thank you for your gifts, for allowing them to have the ability to meet here and for to give them such a low rent. So thank you for believing in the power of Jesus' love. And so I ask that you pray with me now as we pray over the, the offering this morning. God, we thank you um, for your love for us, and we thank you uh, for the ability to give back. Uh, we pray today that, that these offerings, that they may be blessed and they may go to the person who exactly needs it right now. And so we thank you for all the ways that this church gets to reach out to the people of this community and offer a place where they can have transformation. And so thank you uh, for this church, for the people of this church, and the gifts and the passion that they have for you and for transformation of the world. Amen. You know, worship isn't just singing praises to God. Worship is really a, a yielded heart to him. I've said it many times, but you know, we raise our hands and worship, but that's the international sign of surrender. It's, it's a heart that's yielded to Christ. That is, that's what he wants. And that's what he desires from us. It's for us to, to trust him and love him enough to follow him. It's the only logical thing to do. If there's a God that loves us like he says he does, it only makes sense to follow him because he knows us, he designed us, and he knows what's best for us. So. Sing with us.
God, we ask that you'd speak to us through your scriptures, through me. God, may these words, may they not be my own today, but may they be yours. And may they come and change our very hearts to look like you. Amen. Today, as we look at the scripture, we see that God makes a covenant with Noah. Now, it's, it's very similar to the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve, but there are some upgrades. And with these upgrades, it shows us how God really wants us to be in this world. And this part of the story that we read today is, was what told most about Noah's story. God sends the symbol of the rainbow that will always be a reminder to show how his promise to us is that he will never again flood the earth. However, as we listen, as, as I read, there are more in these promises and in these commands to Noah. There are some expectations of God, how God expects us to live in the world. And more importantly, what I really found was really interesting and, and neat this week is there, are, there is some transfer of power in these verses. God empowers Noah and then God empowers us to be like him through this covenant. God created us in his image, and then today we see God empowers us to bear fruit as God bears fruit with the power of life. God gives us the power of life. So we are in, in part two of our series today where Noah moves from the ark to the dry land. God tells Noah three times, at least today, be fruitful and multiply. And so we've been asking, and we'll ask this week and next week, what does it mean to be fruitful in the world in which we live today? So today we begin to discover that to be fruitful is to bring life to any situation where we are. And life is just another word for hope. To bring any situation from worry, anxiety, fear, hopelessness, to wonder, to hope, to life. Now, when, when I finished college, um, I started visiting seminaries. Uh, the seminary that I had planned to go to all along, since accepting my call to ministry, as I went to visit it, I found out that it was not an option for me because, well, this Florida boy was not meant for the Kentucky cold. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to look for something else, some other place. And so by the time that I found the seminary that I wanted to go to, as I was going to the seminary and talking with the recruiter, I realized that I missed the deadline. I missed the deadline for scholarships. What they said, you know, Ryan, you are a candidate for a pretty good and substantial scholarship, but the deadline is passed, and so you probably should just wait another year. I didn't know what to do at that point. Um, I started to go down this trail of hopelessness, I really couldn't afford to go to seminary on my own, um, and so I started asking in that very moment, am I really supposed to go to seminary? Is this a sign? Uh, do I need to rethink the plans that I had made? But there was a pastor who went with me that day, saw my face probably, turned to me and said, well, Ryan, what an opportunity for you. Now you get to work for a church in the area and, and get, get used to the area, get some experience. You know, God is going to use you so that you can be ready for seminary so that you can really succeed. And, well, that was uh, really helpful to me. Um, and it may seem just insignificant to you, but for me, it helped me to see hope when I was starting to go down a trail of hopelessness. And as we see today, his words brought life for me in the future that I was starting to not see. He began to give me life in my future with the words of hope. And so as we see, we, God, God wants to use us and God empowers us to be like the pastor that was with me, to bring life with everything we do, with the people around us, with our words, with our actions, with our very present. And this is all possible because of the life that flows in us and flows through us. So today, uh, I, I want you to listen as I read the scripture. It's a little bit of a long one today, but I want you to hear the whole covenant that God makes with Noah. And so I want you to listen as I read how many promises do, does God make 
to Noah? How many commands, how many commandments, or thou shalt nots, do we see in the scripture? And this is from Genesis 8. It's Genesis 8, 20 through 9, 17. Then Noah, he built an altar to the Lord and took in every clean animal and every clean bird and offered a burnt offering on the altar. And when the Lord smelt the pleasant odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, they shall not cease. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and the dread of you shall rest on every animal of, of the earth and on every bird of the air and on everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand and they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything now. Only you shall not eat of flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your own life, Lord, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I will require it. And from human beings, each one for the blood of another, I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made humankind. And you, be fruitful and multiply, abound on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah, to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And every living creature that is with you, the birds and the domestic animals, every animal of the earth is with you, and as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature, creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set a bow in the clouds, and that shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and of the waters that shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of God for the people of God. So some of these promise repeat or there's different words added in, but there are seven promises. I don't know if you're able to count them all, but there's seven promises to Noah. Some of them again repeat. And then there are four commands and two sins or two commandments. And as I've been looking at it this week really closely, I've, there's a theme with every promise, every command, and every commandment. And I have a lot of research to prove it, as I took out seven pages from my sermon to this week, so I wouldn't be boring you with all these details. But if you want to know, I have some seven pages for you to look at. But in all these promises, in all these commands, in these commandments, the most important thing that I found through all of them was life. The promise show us that not only is life important, but through God's covenant with Noah and through us, we become part of the business of bringing life to wherever we go, to every single situation, through the power that God gives to Noah, and then by extension, that God gives to us. It's an interesting way that God transfers in this scripture. And so from this, what I've what I've come to understand is we must protect life, we must preserve life, and wherever we go, we must look to create life wherever we are. So quickly, in these seven promises that God makes to Noah, God promises to take care of all human life and every creature's as well, and for all generations after Noah. Five times in this scripture, God promises that there will nothing 
nothing ever again that will cut off all life. Never again will there be anything like this flood, God says. Never again will I curse the ground because of human sin. Now I want to stop here just for a second because in that statement, God does something huge. He says that not even human sin will stop God from keeping the promises that God makes to Noah and to all of us. God will not punish the earth or anyone on it, even if we fail to uphold the covenant that God establishes us. This is the definition of grace. But life is the most important for, for God in these commandments. And in these last, and there's two more promises that in these two promises, God creates a system for life to thrive even in a world of sin. And they give us glimpses of what eternal life will look like. For the first time, God promises to create seasons of the year so that harvest would come at the same time every year. And this may be my reading, but there are some others with this as well. But as we look back in the garden, there was really no need for things like rain or sunlight or seasons because as we remember the garden, God provided my, just for real, real quick, uh, this is not a scripted, but my, my mother was telling me about a book who's been, who's been researching people who've had near-death experiences, um, and uh, they've been trying to find out what heaven will be like from these near-death death experiences. And one thing that is common that they found is that people have visions of going to trees and picking fruit, and the, tr and the trees just growing and growing fruit. Now, I don't know if that will be like heaven, but it sounds kind of cool, uh, and it reminds me of what the garden might have been like. But we know that at some point there was sin. Adam and Eve fell into temptation. And so then God, I think, made the earth dependent on the labor from, because he tells Adam, go and till the earth. From your sweat, there will be food for you. And so we can safely see no work, no food. Work, food. So there might not have been seasons, but rather, I think, food was dependent on the labor of mankind, which then Fell, which, which fell into sin. So we can assume that if they stopped laboring, if they stopped working, then there might have probably not been, the food would have been short. And the evidence that I see for this is that at some point before the flood, humans started eating animals without God's permission, which might have been a sin. We don't really know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But here in this covenant, God makes sure that now life will be sustained by God Similar to, similar in some ways, but not the same, but similar to when God walked the earth in the garden. But here, God makes sure that he will take care of us. We see in his promises of Noah that all living creatures are then placed in his hands, similar to what he does with, with Adam. But there is a little more responsibility given, as we see in Genesis 9-2. He says, every living thing, Noah, is now delivered into your hands. God transfers this responsibility to humankind. Every living thing in your hands they are delivered. And oh yes, and, and, and Noah, if you were wondering, can you eat the animals? Yes, you can. But remember, you must take care of them. I made sure that they will fear you and they will listen to you. So care for them. But steak is now on the menu. What this tells me is that life is important, and to be fruitful is to care for, protect, and create life. With this new power, God communicates two sins, two commandments, only two. Do not eat animals with its blood in it, and while we're talking about blood, do not take the blood or kill any human life, for you will pay blood for blood, life for life. God says. So no murder and uh, no steak tartare, even though I would probably never eat steak tartare, raw eggs and raw meat. That just doesn't sound in any way appealing. But so God makes these seven promises to Noah. And through these promises, God sets up a system where we can live and become like God, preserving and creating life wherever we go. And also, no, just be careful, Try to, do not take life so readily because of human sin. But God creates this power for us to be like him. And it seems simple, right? We know what kind of God, how God expects us to live, and I think God gives us these expectations, but 
as we see in the Bible. We are not as smart as I think God may have thought we were. Because, well, Moa, when Moses comes along, there are a lot of thou shalt nots. It goes for up from two to ten and to, well, there's really too many count. If you were to go through the Bible and look for thou shalt not, there's probably a lot. There's probably someone who did the research out there but just know how many. Does anybody know how many thou shalt nots are in the Bible? No, there, well, there's a lot. Uh, you, well, I wouldn't go trying to count them. I would just Google it and probably, you'd probably find the answer. <laughs> but as we look at this, th this commandment, we see that life is important and it's worth taking the risk to save and preserve life. And so if, if we want to know what God means by be fruitful, we see here in this promise, in this covenant, it means to care for and create life power of life is in your hands, Noah. So go create, preserve, and save life. As we look at the Bible up to this point, in the beginning, God breathed life into the earth. Then after human sin, if you work, I will, God will bring you more life. Now in this covenant with Noah, there is a, there is a little bit of a change. There will be for you a new world order where you can become like me. You have the power of life in your hands. And so as we think about our own life. What does this mean for us in the, this covenant and this kind of, this change, this empowerment? What does it mean for me as I go about my daily life trying to be like God? What do I have to rest on knowing that God's power is in me? So, and if you want to know that, all we have to do is look to these commandments that God creates to know and it give us a little clarity, which if you're listening, there are four, com four, four commands that God gives to Noah in this covenant. The first one is be fruitful and multiply, which I see is preserve, create life, and he says this over and over again. Then he says to Noah, fill the earth and replenish the earth. And I see this, bring nourishment back to the earth, Noah. Go and bring life back to the earth, which is just waiting for you. He tells Noah, abound on the earth, which I see that as God just saying, thrive on the earth. And then the last one we say, it's repeated again, but he says, and multiply in it. He says multiply, I think, more than any other time. And it does mean what you think it means, but there is also more meaning to this term, go and multiply. In this commandment, in these commands, we see some assurance from God to Noah. He assures God. He assures Noah that now life can thrive because the evil that threatened life is no more. You can go and go and celebrate life. Noah and, and his family are basically told, go propagate, have children, and celebrate life at every corner, at every single moment. Celebrate life because now there is hope for a future. And one, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but I, I started to notice this week. But you notice that none of Noah's children didn't have any kids before the flood, which I thought was interesting. Uh, some scholars believe that this was because there seemed to be no hope. And humanity was so sinful that to have children was a big risk. And so they did not have children on purpose. Maybe, maybe not, but you could certainly see how that would be a possibility, why they would not have children before going into the ark. But here in this covenant, God says to them, go, celebrate life, because now life can thrive. Create life. You now have the power. God is love, and God is everlasting life. We are to celebrate life in our own life. We are to multiply life wherever we go. And what this means for us is that we go about our daily lives, walking, interacting with people. We are to look for ways that we can bring hope. Wherever we go, to every single conversation, to every single action, we can bring life. Which is why... I thought a lot about Jesus this week as I was preparing my sermon and looking at this covenant. God is life. This is what we see this week, which is why I think Jesus, he spent so much time healing diseases, making people whole. Everyone else around Jesus, they saw Jesus healing and they wondered. Sometimes they even asked him. The religious elite were just astounded by what he was doing. And they asked him, why are you healing people? The disease, isn't it a punishment for sin? We should just let it take its course. 
However, Jesus emphatically over and over says no. Disease is not a result of sin. Disease is the result of evil, which we must go and rid the world of anything that has been touched by evil. Disease, death, all things evil must be gotten rid of so that there can be an abundance and everlasting life. So I ask you this week, how do you take a situation, how do you take a conversation that seems to have hopelessness as the theme, how do you take a situation that just seems, well, bad, and then find a way to transform that situation, that conversation, resembling life, resembling hope. Again, the meaning of life is just another way of saying there is hope. Disease, death, evil, they are hopelessness. God tells Noah, look for ways in which you can bring life with every single step you take when you get out of this ark. I, I, I've been thinking about this. God tells Noah, now, he, they're out of the ark now, and he's, he's looking at Noah, and he says, God, I Noah, I want you to go and look out this world. You know, it probably doesn't look like much now, as it's probably, we can imagine, probably some, be some smells of all the rotten um, wood and plants and everything else that was there. Um, but he says to Noah, go out, look at the world, and now with the power that I give you, go and create life. Turn this earth into something resembling hope something that can be eternal because this is the future for all human life through eternal life. So my question to you again, how do you bring life with your actions, with your words? How are you affirming? How are you loving? How are you kind? How are you bringing life? The Bible says in Ephesians, let no unwholesome word proceed out of my mouth, but only that which is good for building up and that which gives grace to its listeners. Today we see another definition of what it means to be like God. God is grace. God is love. God is life. Last week we looked at the word love. This week we looked how God is defined through the word life. That is central with every promise, every command, and every commandment. God promises he will always remember us. He will never forget us. And he will never look to destroy us again. Rather, he is now dedicated to saving life at all costs, which we know from the New Testament that God paid the ultimate cost to save human life as he sends his own son to die on the cross for everlasting life to become the rule. I said it before that in the covenant with Noah, we begin to see the depths of God's love for us and the ability that we have to be like him, to love as God loves, to bring life as God brings. So now with the power of life, let us go to every situation and bring hope. Let us go and bring hope. How are you bringing life into your relationships? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Go and be the life for your community. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, for the life that you bring to all of us, for the life you are continually bringing to the world around us. God, help us to see the ways in which you are changing this world into the everlasting life of the kingdom of God. God, help us to work with you and help us to always see the way of life. Every conversation, every hard time, every single step we make, help us to see where you are creating new life. We thank you for Noah. We thank you most especially for Jesus, who brought us the everlasting hope of everlasting life. Amen. Y'all stand and worship with me, if you're able. His love never fails.
So may God's life sustain you and encourage you to bring life to every single situation. May it give you the hope that sometimes is hard to find. Amen. So now I, I ask you to pray with me the prayer for this week and grab one as your way out or on your way out. Everlasting Father, Thank you that there is nowhere I can go that is beyond your presence. The Bible says that we should not give up the habit of meeting together, but should preserve and church another. <laughs> Strengthen your church, the attendance of your people. May we be filled with a desire to support and encourage one another in love and in service to you. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words. Your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. Go in peace.